All right, so you asked for it, uh, the evil demon of images. Images. Uh, so this is this is in the mid '80s. I think Baudrillard did this. This was at a lecture, uh, Katina lecture, Cutna lecture, or something. Um, where I feel like this is a in this text he's or in this presentation, this essay, he's responding to some of the ideas about his thought that he doesn't agree with. Notably, the idea that there is a thing called reality, and that that reality actually precedes the image. So, that's a cat. Uh, Baudrillard wants to distance himself from that idea to suggest that, you know, when we're dealing with simulacra, simulacrum, it is in fact the image that precedes reality, as he says. I would like to conjure up the perversity of the relation between the image and its referent, the supposed real the virtual and irreversible confusion of the sphere of images and the sphere of a reality whose nature we are less and less able to grasp. There are many modalities of this absorption, this confusion, this diabolical seduction of images. Above all, it is therefore, sorry, it is the reference principle of images which must be doubled, this strategy by means of which they always appear to refer to a real world, to real objects and to reproduce something which is logically and chronologically anterior to themselves. None of this is true. As simulacra, images precede the real. To the extent that they invert the causal and logical order of the real and its reproduction. Alright, so there's a lot there. Uh, especially if... It, th this would be difficult to kind of chime into if this is the first time, you know, you're reading Baudrillard or hearing this. So I'll try to break it down a little bit. There are a few key terms presented here. One of them being, you know, simulacra. The other one being the image. One of them being the referent. One of them being seduction. And the, all these terms have very important places within Baudrillard's oeuvre. Oeuvre? Oeuvre? Whatever. Uh, but what is most important here is not to position him, and this is exactly what he's writing against, uh, not to think of him as a thinker of images or a thinker of images as they come in contact with various contemporary technologies. So I think that there's a tendency even today for people to see in Baudrillard a way to Baudrillard, Baudrillard a way to understand various uh, cultural phenomena like Instagram, like Facebook, anything like that, like mass media, and to use him as an example and to suggest that all of these things point to Baudrillard being true because, you know, they're simulacra because they are just copies and copies and copies and copies so while there is a kernel of truth to that what that effectively does is it misplaces Baudrillard's what I think to be Baudrillard's real project that is more of a um an ahistorical one or one that cuts across historical and cultural epistemes in a way that disturbs um you know the the comfortable association with his thought and today. So with his thought and all the things I mentioned. And the reason I say that is because, you know, the simulacra has been around for a very long time, the simulacrum. Uh, he gives examples as early as Greece in, I can't remember one of the two, I think it was in his writings on the Gulf War, but it may have been the spirit of terrorism. Um, he talks about the way that Helen of Troy was a simulacrum and how this simulacrum was essentially necessary, perhaps not necessary, but it was the catalyzer for the Trojan War. So that it would be wrong to associate the simulacrum with a specific time and place, something that I think people are wont to do. Instead, we have to look at this much more broadly. So therefore, this thing called reality, I think it's called into question. Because if we've had the simulacrum for however, however many thousands of years, like as and some Baudrillard scholars, you know, go so far back as to look at like cave paintings as being the first, you know, simulacra, then we, it really troubles the, the smooth association or our smooth understanding of a thing called reality. Because it would appear, having established this, that reality has always then been simulacrum has been the simulacrum. 
which I, you know, is difficult to comprehend because I think a lot of people who read Baudrillard stuff, especially, you know, in if you go through the university system, you will probably, if you're doing the humanities or something, at some point be required to read like the first few pages of um, Simulacra and Simulation, even though there I think he's incredibly clear. Uh, but without diving into it too uh, um, very rigorously, I think one might make the mistake to believe that there's like reality on one side and then the simulacrum on the other and that reality precedes the simulacrum. In fact, Baudrillard is doing something entirely different and it's really in another text that he uh, lays it out most clearly where he makes a distinction between two forms of the simulacrum. And in the same book, he states that simula simulation is not the opposite of the real. Simulation is actually, you know, what creates reality. It is specifically what comes about in second order simulacrum, which in itself troubles the whole matrix, you know, presented. But um, yeah, as, in, as far as the simulacrum goes, he presents two oppositionary forms that it can assume. There is non-contradictory simulacrum, which is the idea of a kind of perfect totality, kind of perfect operationality that he is writing against. He doesn't like perfection. Perfection scares him. In opposition to that, there is what he calls conflictual simulacrum. Now this properly corresponds to the entire history of the simulacrum as we've come to understand it, from as far back as the cave paintings and stuff, as far back as any of our relationships to, you know, anything in the world is mediated insofar as they are mediated by our senses, mediated by our, you know, brains turning things into images that can then be consumed. We are always already within the simulacrum. And that kind of what I will reluctantly call a kind of pure simulacrum has is more in line with the idea of the conflictual simulacrum. That is the simulacrum that allows for things to develop and change, uh, the free flow of things that aren't constrained as they are under non-contradictory simulacrum. So the way that we should properly understand Baudrillard's thought then is not as being um, a kind of agonistic struggle between reality and the simulacrum. Rather, it is between two different forms of the simulacrum. One, on one side, conflictual reality, conflictual simulacrum, which is like where there's possibility, where there's conflict, where there's antagonism. And then on the other side, where there's non-contradictory simulacrum, where things are perfect and clean and nice and smooth. So we should, you know, really contrast those and not reality and the simulacrum. Oh God, okay, I think I laid that out. So to go, come back to this text, the evil demon of images, we can assume the same thing about images, where images can assume a, an oppressive form that is a non-contradictory one, one that doesn't allow mobility or movement or anything, and then a conflictual one, one that allows possibility and antagonism and all that type of stuff. So this is, pays credence to when he says, and still on this first page, uh, it is precisely when it appears most truthful most faithful and most in conformity to reality that the image is most diabolical. That is because reality is itself something that Baudrillard resents. Reality is, you know, always already determined by a kind of authority. authority. And that authority could be like science for him is one that he writes against that attributes um, a kind of truthfulness to various things. One example that I, I like to use is like, you know, bio biology, where like men are born and have X, Y, and Z attributes, and that's it. You are stuck in that, and that's all. And then women, same thing. Uh, this is what I think is properly understood as reality. That is the kind of entering of truth into discourse so that very little mobility is allowed. So the same thing can be applied here to images where when there is a belief that the image points to a reality, or even when there's the idea that the image stands in stark uh, distinction, contradistinction to reality, 
then it just reinforces the idea that there is a thing called reality out there and that it is sequestered. It is kind of covered over by the image, which simply, you know, invigorates the sense that there is this thing called truth and that this truth can be unearthed. So what are the implications of this? Well, he tells us soon after that last quote on the second page um, that this essentially is mirrored by people. So when the image conforms to an idea of reality that is imposed, that doesn't exist, that doesn't float above everything like a god, uh, but is imposed through various regulatory mechanisms, um, then the masses, a term he uses, but one that I I shy away from, uh, but when people are more than willing to um, conform themselves and give themselves over to the same ideas, the same kind of ideas that are housed or imbued with a transcendent status or transcendent meaning. And this then has the negative effect of having, you know, that annulling any kind of emancipatory potential because, you know, it goes back to that overused dictum. Like, if everyone is, you know, free to go toward this thing, then then no one is, you know. But as per any good Baudrillardian thought, there are no absolutes. And this is where I think he gets the most difficult to understand. So where, while there is this conformity, and this conformity could be seen as being a bad thing, he says that it is impossible for anything to really drive towards its own uh, end. <laughs> and I say that in like, like 10 examples where he actually says that exact thing, you know, fucking come into my head, but whatever. Uh, instead, he says that there's always a reversibility at play where any effort or any kind of drive towards something will result in the exact opposite occurring. It's kind of a strange idea. But he tells us, um, jump down a bit there. Uh, There is, in this conformity, a force of seduction, in the literal sense of the word, a force of diversion, distortion, capture, and ironic fascination. There is a kind of fatal strategy of conformity. So he continues a little further down. To begin to resemble the other, to take on their appearance, is to seduce them, since it is to make them enter the realm of metamorphosis despite themselves. So when you have people conform in this kind of mass way, what that essentially does for Baudrillard is, on a kind of simplistic reading, when the first one he proposes, you know, it turns all people into mindless zombie-like things. But at the same time, he says that that presents an opportunity for people to, you know, recognize that. It presents an opportunity to disturb the simple association with any individual and themselves. You know, the idea of the self that portends, that comes before, that kind of sets the stage for any kind of possibility. So by virtue of that conformity, you know, what the jackals of science or religion or anything want people to do, that is to conform, Baudrillard says that there is an undoing in that very process just because it makes a mockery of what that conformity might look like. It makes it, it turns it into a, a farce, a kind of carnival. So while conformity is bad and something that should be, you know, fought, uh, it also points to the limits of this idea of you know, selfness, this idea of singularity, this idea of um, isolation, in order to open up new possibilities, to disturb the idea of a kind of groundedness that is so, you know, well, you know, assumed. Or we can even look at this another way. Uh, Why is this conformity necessary if what the, uh, you know, the jackals of science or so-called natural scientists believe to be true, like, There are various X, Y, and Z uh, truths of, you know, men or truths of women. Why is it that these things need to be enforced if they were true, if they are biologically determined and allow little mobility in and of themselves? Why do they need to be, you know, pushed down our throats? It just shows the extent to which they are perhaps artificial in and of themselves. And this is the project of the image itself 
to by reflecting reality it can distort it it can reveal the limits of that reality or as he says the image is interesting not only in its role of, as reflection mirror representation or of counterpart uh, but also when it begins to contaminate reality and to model it when it only confirms to re- conforms to reality the better to distort it or better still when it appropriates reality for its own ends when it anticipates it to the point that the real no longer has time to be produced as such. So he gives us an example of this uh, using Coppola's Apocalypse Now, where he says that this uh, Apocalypse Now is the extension of war by other means, or as he says, uh, his film is very much the prolongation of war by other means, the completion of that incomplete war, it's apotheosis, it's kind of climax. War becomes film, film becomes war, the two united in their mutual overflow of technology. So by turning the film, the war into a film, uh, it essentially shows the extent to which that war was, you know, not a kind of real thing. And it perhaps shows the extent to which that war was actually just a film, a kind of spectacle of itself uh, in the first place. And it was only when it became a film did it actually like, you know, finish which, you know, it's, Baudrillard is a provocative kind of playful thinker, like, you know, I don't think anyone would get very far reading this stuff and saying like, oh, what, what do you mean it's not real? Uh, what, what, what does that mean? You gotta just, you know, go with the flow, take it in, because um, it leads to very interesting places when you kind of accept it. But that being said, it's good to be critical too. So to continue with this idea of, of war, uh, the, the Vietnam War, Baudrillard says that the Americans might have, you know, lost the war, but they won the movie. The movie was what gave them the victory, because the movie is what entered the war into the westernized media spectacle that is the real, you know, um, military industrial complex. Like, too much time, I think, in like political circles, I spent, you know, taking on you know, militaries as we understand them today, you know, like armed people with tanks and, you know, planes, where we don't, we fail to see that there is a kind of imperialism present in the very, you know, foundations of our media environment. But we don't, we don't see that because it's just so well entrenched within us. And the media spectacle is so much more effective because it doesn't come with the same destructive um, kind of events that make war so detestable. It is the clean version of war. It is war without, you know, the possibility of protest. But what this will come down to then, or what this comes down to then, is um, the impossibility of like a clean break from it. So as Baudrillard says, what will happen will never be an explosion, but implosion. Because everything is absorbed by the media machine in which we are entrenched, the only way for us to go is out, not for something to come in, because everything has already been absorbed by this very logic. So it would demand a kind of ex- an implosion, an explosion from the inside to bring the system down. So there can therefore be then no good use or no, or as he says, no uh, moral, meaningful, pedagogic, or informational usage of, um, uh, uh, what was I, of the image. Or as he says in another text, that is, I think, in Fatal Strategies, he says, uh, in order to, you know, take on terrorism, we must renounce information itself. Because it is the information cycle, the media machine, that keeps these things going in their constant proliferation. So then, On this point, he gives us another example, that is uh, the Holocaust series, which was a television series, uh, I guess, in the 80s or late 70s, which I don't know about. I've never actually seen it. And he has a, he writes about this in Simulacra and Simulation, so this will be repetitive if you've read that, where he says that the forgetting of the Holocaust is a terrible thing. It's something that, you know, should never be forgotten. Uh, And what is worse is, of course, people denying that it happened. But he says that of those, uh, what is worse than the forgetting of the war is the kind of simulation of that experience, the kind of turning it into a media spectacle, you know, 
that absolves it of its meaning. Because as he says, you know, images, television screens, all that are, uh, are what um, absorb meaning, that take, or it's another word, that um, evacuate a message of its meaning. So for the, this TV series for Baudrillard, um, is an artificial memory that replays the extermination, but too late for it to profoundly unsettle anything. And above all, it does so via a medium which is itself cold, radiating oblivion, dissuasion and extermination in an even more systematic manner. If this is possible, then the camps themselves, if, if, more so than the camps themselves, because it makes it renders them banal. It makes them just something that can be watched, you know, after dinner in a comfortable place and, you know, can be turned off afterwards and let it just pass right by, which is one of the, you know, great strategies of Donald Trump uh, and whether or not this is on purpose is neither here nor there. Uh, but when you, when you saturate the media with a limitless supply of stuff to cling on, cling on, <laughs> to cling on to, what that effectively does is renders all of it moot. So it doesn't matter what he does or says. In a week, we're going to forget. And we're, in a week, we're not going to care because there's already 12 other things that needed to get addressed, which is genius. It really is. Um, but yeah, I think that the same can be said here, or at least bringing it to present day conversations. That is why so little can get done about it so much of this hinges upon the media's um, taking up these issues but because the media are indifferent they don't care what you know comes their way as long as it, you know it'll attract people then nothing actually ends up holding traction nothing can hold its weight and just dissolves disappears into the next media event spectacle so what he says about the uh, television show about the Holocaust I think can really be applied to this current phenomenon where he says that the uh, the same process of forgetting, of liquidation, of extermination, the same annihilation of memories and of history, the same inverse implosive radiation, the same absorption without a trace, the same black hole as Auschwitz. I think that perfectly captures the situation we find ourselves in, in but like in no way, you, you know, saying that they are equal. Uh, one event is a lot worse than the other. But I think he's speaking very accurately to our propensity to forget and our propensity to fall into just the simple, you know, um, that's into the spectacle machine, which lends itself over to anything, anything that'll just draw us in. But we need not rely on this example of the, the Holocaust television series. He tells us right here that the collusion between images and life between the screen and daily life can be experienced every day in the most ordinary manner. Especially in America, not the least charm of which is that even outside the cinemas, the whole country is cinematograph cinematographic. So Baudrillard contrasts this development of, you know, screens in every home with other forms of media, like architecture, painting, even cinema, that he says houses still some... Um, some connection to the imaginary, some connection to the unknown, which Baudrillard applauds, Baudrillard appreciates, because it disturbs, you know, reality, as, you know, the television screen is always on, and because it's always on, and because of its indifference, it doesn't care what it's projecting, um, it becomes the way that we actually learn about things, it becomes the way that we actually ascertain what meaning is and because it is indifferent because meaning doesn't actually exist there we develop a very uh, a, a bankrupt sense of meaning but we should also be careful not to like impose a kind of neoplatonism onto this uh, phenomenon to suggest you know that there are real forms of art and false forms of art instead uh, and we just need to take Baudrillard again as an example uh, and in other texts He's cautious to even do that, to suggest that maybe within television there's, you know, 
another mystery to be unraveled. Perhaps all this explosion of meaning is just, you know, we shouldn't even take it to be so true in itself. Perhaps there's more going on. So we should also be cautious when we read this stuff in him, because in other, in other places he kind of undoes that a little bit. Now, with that being said, I don't, I'm not, I don't think that you need to have like a full understanding of everything that's going on in his work to be able to read any given piece, but it, I think it still helps to know. So I, I digress a little bit. Um, to talk about the cinema, because it's not totally off the hook, uh, he, he cautions against the efforts in cinema to perfectly replicate, to perfectly mirror what we understand to be reality. So one example he gives is Kubrick's uh, Barry Lyndon. And for those that are not familiar with the film, uh, it's one that I think you should definitely see, perhaps only once because it's long and slow. Um, but it's a fantastic film. Uh, but it is one where Kubrick tried to film it using like like 99% of the film is done only using natural lighting. So this kind of attempt to, you know, disturb the boundary between cinema and reality as we understand it because apparently not natural light is natural or natural light is real which is totally random that we ascribe it with this kind of meaning but still we do uh Baudier is suggesting that these efforts kind of take us out of the possibility of cinema that kind of you know foreclose what cinema could be so previously, he says, there was a dialectical, full and dramatic relationship between cinema and the imaginary, that is, novelistic, mythical, unreality, even down to the delirious use of its own technique. Today, there is an inverse negative relation between cinema and reality. It results from the loss of specificity, which both have suffered cold, cool, which both have suffered cold collage, cool promiscuity, asexual engagement of two cold media, which evolve an asymptotic line toward one another, cinema attempting to abolish itself in the absolute of reality, the real already long absorbed in, cin in cinematographic or televised hyperreality. Oh, so that, well, that's, you know, the end of the text here. Um, and, you know, good stuff. I mean, I love this stuff, but it's hard for me to, you know, present it because there's, there's so much here and he's such a strange writer and provocative thinker that it's so much, you have to really read it yourself and read some of his other things. But I think that that gets at what, you know, he was trying to do here. Um, I hope I made it easier. I don't know. I'm just rambling. If anyone listened and you liked it or hated it, let me know. Uh, just leave a comment. You know how to do that. Uh, but on that note... <laughs>